The Gathering served as the pilot movie for JMS's series, Babylon 5, which, like many shows, was a challenge to get made, and in its case, that showed. When launched, the pilot was overall unimpressive and received poor reviews, and I'll confess that the entirety of my first run experience with B5 was this one and Babylon Squared, which I'll be getting to next month. But personally, my exposure to B5 did not impress me either. The show took a lot of time to find its legs, which is certainly true of a lot of successful shows, such as Star Trek The Next Generation or Stargate SG-1, which struggled a bit to find what made them work, make them their best. So in that case, B5 was in good company, but it did suffer another setback, which was a year between the pilot and the series proper, and a significant portion of the characters introduced being replaced, more than a third since Kosh doesn't directly do much of anything the whole movie. Imagine if TNG had replaced Riker, Dr. Crusher, and Troy right after Encounter at Farpoint. Or if SG-1 replaced Hammond and Daniel Jackson immediately following Children of the Gods. Well, you might be saying, well, not a fair comparison. Daniel Jackson's story arc was launched in the pilot. To which I say, yes, exactly. The Gathering wasn't just to introduce us to the world of B-5. It was to set an overall story in motion. And the changes played havoc with that. Now, to Jamis' credit, he would work to take these problems and find ways to turn them into stuff to help the story. For instance, two characters who don't come back are implied to have been called back to Earth for what seems pretty shady reasons, which fits in with the shady Earth elements that were in this season. After the pilot's release, there was discussion about the problems with it on the net. JMS was active in the online community long before that kind of thing was the norm. And as a pioneer of that early interaction, his involvement was quite different than what you see from celebrities and creatives doing today. So JMS took some of the comments to heart. He also told them that the chance of a director's cut was, quote, the odds are zero. Well, zero is the new yes, because the version that we're looking at today is the director's cut. Well, it's technically called the special edition since A, JMS didn't direct the episode, and B, the original was basically the director's cut. JMS says that because he was new to executive producing and had never been in an editing room, he was hesitant to make any changes to the director's version. The interesting thing that happened was a great deal of the things that the audience didn't care for was stuff that he himself would have changed if he wasn't worried about ruining it. So the original is more of the director's version and the special edition, JMS's vision. So how did this happen? B5 was released through PTEN. Primetime Entertainment Network, which was a weird hybrid of a network and syndication. It was a joint project of Warner Brothers and Chris Craft Industries. And while you no doubt are familiar with the former, you might be saying, what the hell is this Chris Craft Industries? Sounds like they make plastics or something. Well, they were a company that made plastics. And apparently now television shows. This silly experiment was part of both companies' attempts to explore a fifth network in the wake of Fox's success as a fourth. But then what happened? Warner Brothers announced a year later that they were making the WB network. And after that, Chris Craft joined with Paramount to make UPN. So B5 was the television equivalent of a child adopted by a couple who were in the middle of a divorce. Why am I getting into all of that? Well, PTEN was going belly up thanks to all of this, and when it closed down, B5 wound up moving over to TNT, part of the Warner Brothers family. With the move was a plan for some Babylon 5 movies, such as next week's In the Beginning, which served as a prequel to the series, and sequel, sort of, it's complicated. It was immediately followed then by a broadcast of The Gathering, which had set it all up, except it was so very different from the series in terms of editing, music, characters, makeup, and it focused on Jeffrey Sinclair, who had only appeared in In the Beginning in archival footage. Well, frankly, the pilot movie needed every bit of help it could get. Thus was the special edition version created, rescored by Christopher Franca, who did all of the music for the series. And they replaced a few of the special effects. But most importantly, there was a substantial re-editing and an inclusion of footage that had been excised from the original cut. In addition, PTEN had reworked the story from six acts to nine acts to allow for more commercial breaks. The special edition shifted it back to six again by moving things around. All of this made the gathering more character-focused, more tightly paced, more consistent with the series, more, well, let's be honest, more watchable. So with that, 
Let's jump into Babylon 5, The Gathering, Special Edition, a.k.a. the only version you should watch. It begins with a voiceover by Londo talking about the significance of the Babylon stations. Of note is that this was changed a bit for the Special Edition because one thing he said was that Sinclair would be the last commander of Babylon 5, which obviously he would not be. Much of what he says would be part of the opening narration from now on. Our last best hope for peace. Dawn of the third age of mankind. And that Brandon Tartikoff was the devil. Laurel Takashima is handling things up in command at the moment. Sinclair's off handling what he calls tourist problems. The scene has already established that Takashima is a professional, but not excessively uptight. And that Sinclair is a man who likes handling things himself. Which isn't easy when you're responsible for all of this. But advising people on who to bone is probably not what he needs to be doing. You know the rules about crossing species. Stick with the list. Obviously, you've never met an Arnassian before. After they finish, they eat their meat. Ha! <laughs> and they all laughed when I bought a crotchless shark suit. Garibaldi's been trying to get in touch with him. Sinclair, not the I want to bone a spider guy. Because their new telepath, Lita Alexander, has arrived. Sinclair gives the breakdown of what to do and not to do. He doesn't tell her to avoid boning dangerous aliens because most people don't need to be told that. But he's interrupted by a guy trying to smuggle dust onto the station. And he takes a hostage because everything goes berserk. Okay, either dust is the name of a kind of drug or this place's policies were written by Adrian Monk. Sinclair goes to talk him down personally, offering safe passage off the station for letting the hostage go rather than risking a firefight where all these people are. The guy knows a deal when he sees one, so he lets her go and Sinclair keeps his word, although he warns the next time their welcoming gift for him is going to be a hail of lasers tearing through his ship. I think that's the Vorlon welcoming gift too. Up in command, Jakar is introduced, doing his best to act like the villain in a Joel Schumacher Batman film. Lieutenant Commander Takashima! Give me all the diamonds or I'll blast you with my web gun! He's cheesed off because their ship will not be allowed to dock unless it submits to a weapons scan to keep all unauthorized weapons off the station. Last thing you want on a pressurized space station are people firing off guns. Well, the last thing you want are no escape ships and an air shaft full of xenomorphs, but you get the point. This kind of thing is probably why Sinclair is happy to be running around playing tour guide. If he's not in command, aliens can't find and yell at him. Speaking of Sinclair and aliens, his shortcut to lead his quarters leads right through the alien sector, which has a methane atmosphere. This was severely edited for the special edition because JMS really wanted to show aliens with different human mindsets to their living quarters and privacy and all of that. Unfortunately, this made the whole thing look like the aliens were exhibits at the zoo, so unless they want Garibaldi tossing their visiting delegates peanuts, it was best to just remove the scene. Lita provides the question that many may wonder, why is the place called Babylon 5? So Sinclair explains the first three stations were sabotaged, and the fourth vanished without a trace. But we're sure this one is going to work for sure, dead sure. Tick, tick, tick. As for the Babylon part, he doesn't say, but I figure that if you want to show your desire for peace, giving it a name frequently associated with hubris and decadence is the way to go. Sinclair finally shows up with his staff, now including their doctor, Dr. Kyle, talking about the arriving Vorlon ambassador that they know so little about. The single largest problem with the gathering, in either form, is exposition. JMS wanted to create a whole lived-in world with history and all of that, which is great, but the pilot hits you with so much of it that it's both overwhelming and often boring. We're at 10 minutes in, and we already have three mysteries. The disappearance of Babylon 4, the sabotage of Babylons 1 through 3, and the fact that Vorlons are so unknown. Mystery is good, as it helps to invest people and make them speculate and wonder and look for clues. But this is an example of too much too soon, because the first two will have nothing to do with the gathering at all. Now the goal of the series was to create self-contained stories within a long-form story, so not everything needs an answer right now. I get that. But I think in this case, a bit of pruning and saving for the launch of the series itself would have helped because there's too much stuff being launched at the audience that keeping up with the complex plot is going to make this even more difficult. B5 is often smart and sophisticated TV, but this is a case of it overextending that so it's no longer smart and sophisticated, 
it's overcomplicated and dull. What makes this a particular problem is that Michael O'Hare, despite putting on a smile, comes across as a very straight-laced performer. He's not wooden, but he seems slightly robotic, which is... I'll get more into it later. But this is then exacerbated by that aspect of the show, because so much of the show is about him, and so much of the exposition is around him. Here's another example. He's summoned to talk to Ambassador Delenn of the Mimbari, where she muses about her people's belief in the power of one mind to change the universe, as represented by the Japanese stone garden here. One person can make all the difference. Or as I like to think of it, it just takes one idiot to screw everything up. She, um, yeah, the other thing. Delenn was originally planned to be male, and then when the chrysalis thing happens become female as well as part human, but they couldn't get the voice alteration for her to sound more masculine so that it would work right. So when the series started, they just said F it and made it undeniably clear she was female. Through dialogue, I mean. This isn't Game of Thrones here. As I was saying, she is intrigued by the Vorlons, always wanting to meet one, and kindly shares the classified data her people have on them with Sinclair, surprising him since there's still a bit of bad blood over the Earth Mimbari War. Having to surrender a war you effectively won will do that, almost as much as being on the receiving end of an attempt at genocide. We've seen Takashima have to deal with the routine, with an outraged Jakar, and with the mysterious, but now is the moment when she gets rattled, when the Vorlons arrive early. Their ambassador Kosh has arrived and she is pissed. The implication is that this is inconvenient, but I have to think that being yelled at by an alien for doing exactly what you told him you were going to do it's got to be even more irritating. What's more curious is that the next scene in a blink and you'll miss it background, someone is rendezvousing with Checkered Coat Man, who had been popping up here and there and looking all shifty and ominous. Well, the scan for entry of the room for the arrival says that this is Takashima, whom we just established is pitching a fit up in command. Once the arrival, who looks Minbari from behind, has arrived, a weapon goes off, so I think the meeting is off to a bad start. First rule of all my meetings is, don't shoot me. While the fake Takashima is doing that, the real one has her hands full, and that's when Jakar shows up. Luckily, though, he's not here to fight again, but rather to acquiesce and let the ship be scanned. Yes, that's reasonable. That's why it's so suspicious. Jakar was an intriguing idea JMS had for a pseudo-villain. He intentionally created Jakar as the scenery-chewing, cartoonishly villainous antagonist that was expected in SF television. Cast an actor who was notable for playing villains and other shady characters, and made it clear to everyone who the bad guy was here. With the specific plan for the character to change in response to events, and in fact become a loyal ally and deeply moral man. Now, this was quite a move. But unfortunately, with the other issues, this contributed to the weakness of the gathering, which I know sounds in contrast to my comment about being overcomplicated. Having an obvious villain seems to help make things easier, but in a vacuum, it makes B5 seem too pulpy. This is only on first viewing, I should add. Looking back, it helps to show how the character needs to move beyond his hate and mistrust if he's ever going to truly serve his people. Of course, between now and then, he's got things to do, like proposing he hire Lita Alexander for sex on the pretense of adding her genetic gifts to his people. Original. If you're desperate enough, you might want to add that one to the playbook, I guess. By now, we've actually met Londo, the great narrator, doing one of his favorite things, gambling to win big money, soon followed by another of his favorite things, trying to persuade people to loan him money for gambling. When Garibaldi refuses, Checkered Coat Guy is willing to pony up the dough, which I guess means that he was the one who did the shooting, or else the bullet was too repulsed by his fashion sense to touch his coat. Garibaldi was here to tell Londo to come meet Kosh. His green squid ship is arriving soon, and Sinclair is eager to meet with him. That's why it sucks that the elevator stalls with him in it on the way to meet Kosh. And there he is, to command dignity... The Vorlons try to travel around in suits that look like a robot peering out of a Han Dynasty ornamental toilet that's wearing a muumuu. Well, by the time Sinclair shows up, Garibaldi and Takashima have already arrived, only to find Kosh lying on the floor not looking good. They have him rushed over to the med lab and work to create a safe environment to even look at him to try to help. Only there's no point. The Vorlon authorities do not want his suit opened under any circumstances. 
Sinclair is not ready to let the ambassador die and destroy any hope of this peace thing that they're working on. So he has all the recording devices deactivated and sends Dr. Kyle in alone, reasoning that his vow of confidentiality is good enough. Though there's still some trepidation. We were talking the other day about how nobody's seen a Vorlon before. And he said that according to legend, one human did see a Vorlon. He turned to stone. No, 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 Commander. It's a Vorlon, not a Gorgon. That Muslim holy book? Now that's a Koran. That skirt wrap thing in Southeast Asia. That's a sarong. Oh, when all the lions combine together into a robot. Now that's Voltron. You really sure it's not the turn to stone thing? Why would looking at anything make you turn to stone? How do I know? Do I look like a Vorlon? Besides the fact that nobody knows what they look like and you're not turning to stone. But look, what you're talking about is spontaneous transmutation being caused by being looked at. Maybe it has to look at you then. You mean like a basilisk? Yes, doctor, this is very important. Do you have a weasel? It might save your life. Well, of course not. Obviously. Somebody said we don't need any weasels in the med lab. As soon as this mystery is over, you are both fucking fired. Sinclair reports to a senator he knows, likely on some special committee that oversees the military, or B-5 specifically, and it seems the Vorlons are pitching a fit over this, and the senator is not happy that he left this in Garibaldi's hands. Sinclair has the utmost belief in Garibaldi's abilities, though, and says so, especially looking into that broken elevator thing. And speaking of up and down, Sinclair's girlfriend is waiting for him in bed back in his quarters. We'd met her briefly earlier to learn that she's got her own ship. She also would not make the jump to the series, and would in fact be the first of several characters that JMS was trying to get to accomplish a very specific role It just kept getting cocked up along the way. JMS was good with what he called trap doors to deal with problems like these, Lita managing the amazing double trap door of being jettisoned for Talia, and then having her come back when Talia was jettisoned to bring Lita in again. But one of the positives of all of these trapdoors is that the characters were brought in to fill in if they were needed, and since they often were not, they gave the show an interesting set of minor characters to complement the main ones. Anyway, the post-Nookie cuddling is interrupted by a word from Dr. Kyle. Kosh was poisoned. The answer is to figure out how the poison got into his system, then they can likely isolate it, synthesize an antidote, and make Kosh right as rain again. Security. Security here. This is Commander Jeffrey Sinclair. We have confirmation of an attempted assassination. Another one? Wow, they're dropping like flies around here, sir. No, no, it's just the one. Was it a basilisk? Someone told me there was a basilisk around here. I'm going to bed. If anything turns up, feel free to not bother me. Elsewhere, Jakar is railing to Delenn about Londo, convinced that he is the assassin, in order to form an alliance with Earth by bringing in the fear of the Vorlon. Thus, the only answer to such a thing would be an alliance between the Narn and the Mimbari, their technology and his people's bottomless manpower. Delenn shoots down the idea of such a thing, leaving unspoken how much devastation it would bring to the galaxy if that were to ever happen. The galaxy had already seen what the Mimbari would do when they get mad, hitch that wagon to the resentful rage of the Narn, and the shadows would be like, screw it guys, we could just go back to sleep. To make the point clear as he rails about the Great Council, she pulls out the One Ring of Power and dicks with him for a while until he gets the point that he better leave. Some people just need a look. Others need to be crushed under four Gs. That'd be great for dealing with when people show up in the months to come to try to get me to put a politician's sign on my front lawn. Lando doesn't need that. He just needs to see Garibaldi's face to know that he should go. Whether Garibaldi wants him to go or not is another matter. After being pressed, he admits, shocker, that he stayed in the casino. Checkered Coat Guy had offered to cover Londo's bets and then ditched him when it was time to pay up. A big part of the improvements to this cut is the greater emphasis on character. So as Londo follows up by railing over the Centauri's fall to the joke they are now, we see the glimmers of the man he will become. The patriotic, jingoistic, bellowing voice of a risen Centauri Empire. Despite his comment in the very scene, that is time war goes out of fashion to show the irony. Knowing its cost, but so tantalizing for those who want power and respect, war is your go-to. Likewise, character plays into the following restored scene between Takashima and Dr. Kyle, 
where she offers fresh coffee from beans grown in a few spots in the hydroponics garden. But that's... Against regs, I know. The garden is to be used strictly for grains, fruits, and vegetables. But I hid them behind your cannabis plants so no one will ever know. He's here because he has a plan, but a pretty bad one. Have their telepath look into Kasha's mind and see where the poison was administered so that they can treat it. And he's bringing this to her so that Sinclair will be kept clear of all this. So she gives a speech about how apathy and Mars security led her to ignoring the rules. But Sinclair arrived to put her back on the straight and narrow. I haven't broken the rules in a long time, Doctor. Huh? What about the coffee plants you just admitted were against the rules? Next time, don't make the speech in the same scene, Takashima. A little distance will make it more believable. Of course, neither of them have to actually do it. Lita does, and she sure as shit does not want to. But with the alternative, virtual certain destruction of this station that she's trapped on in the very first salvo of yet another war that will likely wipe out the human race. They say it's her choice, but obviously there's no choice. So while she's grumbling over that, Garibaldi is reporting on his progress. Turns out one alibi I checked out doesn't hold up. Oh, whose? Yours. Did I mention the senator and I agree that you suck at this job, Garibaldi? There's no record of a malfunction with the elevator, which is odd because, well, maybe Sinclair would double bluff Garibaldi about that if it didn't happen. Why would I tell you to investigate if I knew it would prove my guilt? But generally, anyone who says, inspect my alibi, please, usually has their alibi sewn up. Kind of like claiming, I couldn't have done that. I was having a dinner date with Beyonce at the time. While she was on stage accepting a Grammy. That's right. And right in the middle of the fish course. Couldn't have timed it worse. While they're discussing that, Lita has entered Kasha's mind and relived the event, seeing Commander Sinclair slap a disc on the back of Kasha's right hand. It's an overwhelming experience as she struggles to recover and tell them about the poison. Meanwhile, Sinclair's walking around thinking how his day can't get any worse, walks in, and Lita stands up and yells, J'accuse! What's more, somehow Earth hears about what's happened in virtually no time, as Sinclair was accused by a witness of being responsible. So they relieve him of command, since having him run the investigation into what he did would probably not convince the Vorlons that they were being objective. Sinclair has no choice but to go along with it, but the rest are incensed. You can't expect us to stand here and do nothing while they railroad you. Oh yes, break the rules, please. That did such a good job of helping me out last time. If you help me any more, I'm going to get the gas chamber. So they go along with the hearing that the council has set up to look into this, where Jakar basically takes on the role of prosecutor, while Londo assumes the role of guy who's thinking about how he's going to pay back that loan shark. Things get ugly when it's brought up that the poison used is quite rare, only coming from one system, one that Sinclair's girlfriend just returned from. The classic exotic murder weapon plot. For people who want to frame others, or just for bad guys who are more concerned with style than actually getting away with it. Garibaldi has good news though. Checkered Coat Guy has a criminal record, and he had contact with both Lita and Londo. And he's a wanted man in Earth space, so coming to an Earth Alliance station is just asking to be arrested. With that, these connections and this massive debt, and his terrible fashion sense, of course, something is obviously up with this guy. So Garibaldi is going to look into this lead. But time's running out. Jakar is pushing for Sinclair to be sent to the Vorlon homeworld to stand trial. Earth votes no. The Membari abstain. Jakar and Londo vote yes. Well, without an actual majority, the motion can't carry. But Jakar says the Vorlons heard about his plan and are voting yes. So it looks like an orange jumpsuit is in Sinclair's future. His one hope now, checkered coat guy, is a dead end because he's a dead end. Garibaldi finds the body in his quarters. If he was killed before when we saw that weapon go off, then how come we've seen him running around since then? Or has the dead fashion turned him into a zombie somehow? As if that wasn't weird enough of a thing to wrap the mind around, Jakar is a meeting with Lita in the alien sector, where he shows off his gill implants that means that he doesn't need to have a mask in here. Well, either this means that his nookie arrangements with her are more freaky-deaky than we thought. You put on your oxygen mask and I'll get my Batman costume, and no matter what happens, don't let go of the trapeze. Or else it means that these two must be in cahoots about something else now. But why Lita would have anything more to do with Jakar is confusing. 
His only other unresolved concern this movie has been sowing mistrust between Earth and the other powers. And why would Lita want to help him with that? And it's not because she's that committed to seeing Sinclair pay for what he did, because she asked to remain anonymous in all of this. If she had actually testified, it would have made it abundantly clear that there was evidence. Elsewhere, Londo was apologizing to Garibaldi about the vote. Seems Jakar blackmailed him into it. Not through the gambling, though. That would exhaust any audience sympathy, that he would be willing to sell Sinclair up the river to cover his own losses. But with proof that Londo's grandfather was guilty of atrocities, protecting himself and his family from things that he had nothing to do with, that's much more understandable, especially when he says that he had assumed it wouldn't make a difference because of the tie. Jakar would just, you know, make a big show of everything. And if you had known, would you have done anything different? No. This is my weakness. My failure. And I'm sorry. Truly sorry. While he's packing, Sinclair loses his temper when he finds his medal for the line, just in time for his girlfriend to show up. He's pissed because, unlike in the pilot's chair, here he has to make decisions that affect Earth and its place in the galaxy. Whereas when he's in combat, he just has to survive. The Lion was the last battle of the Mimbari War and showed how bad things could get if just one person made the wrong decision. Mimbari overwhelming the solar system, the human race on the edge of extinction. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Again, I do not want to give the impression that I think Michael O'Hare is a wooden or bad actor because he is not. When he gets performances like this, when his involvement in the most important battle in human history is brought up, and he says, I didn't want to talk about it. His words make clear just how deeply that experience cut him. That even now, it takes his breath away thinking about what happened. Well, here's the thing to try to describe it is, he performs a great deal like actors in the black and white era did. Like a Peter Graves, for instance. So I think I get the subconscious impression he has, he has a stick up his ass, even when he's trying to be jocular. Obviously, that's not now. He talks about the Battle of the Line and his role in it. I'll save that for in the beginning next week. But suffice to say, it's quite powerful here. Again, with the edited version enhancing it with audio clips from other episodes and Franca's music. Just a few things took one more bit of monologue in an episode overflowing with such things and instead turned it into a powerful, engaging moment. Sinclair releases another mystery into the wild, the one Jakar mentioned. Why, when humanity was so beaten, did the Mimbari surrender? And what happened during the 24 hours that he can't remember starting during the battle? Although it's not out of the question that going on a suicide run when the world is ending might involve drinking enough to forget what you were doing. Down in Med Lab, Lita shows up while Dr. Kyle's puzzling over the fact that Checkered Coat Guy's body has been dead for far longer than eyewitness testimony says. But all Lita cares about is fiddling with the switches and dials until the alarms go off. He tries to fight her off, but she whoops his ass, so he whips out a laser of some kind and blasts her in the arm. Then Lita stumbles into... Lita? All right, well, no choice now. The only way to determine what's going on here is for you two to start making out. Go ahead. Dr. Kyle manages to save Kosh, seems to be a full-time job for him now, and it's about time we reel in that other plot thread. We saw the ship clamp onto the hull outside, and it went largely unnoticed, save for a small leak of atmosphere. Well, eventually they must have figured out what's up, because they're bringing it in for Garibaldi and Sinclair to look at. It's a one-person craft good for short range only, meaning someone went to a lot of trouble to smuggle a person on board the station which is surprising when they could have just got the hand stamped and gotten in for half off. And the pieces are tied together when they discover what checkered coat guy was selling. A changeling net. A holographic disguise system. Illegal not just because, you know, that causes mass confusion, but the field itself is so powerful it eventually f proves fatal to the user. Of course, with that much power, they can track it down to the source. And Sinclair will be going personally because, after all the bullshit he's been through, having a chance to shoot at somebody will be really therapeutic. Plus, he wants this resolved, so he's going to have to act fast. The Vorlons have arrived, and they are loaded for bear. All right, seal off the area. I'm taking care of this personally. If we need help, we'll link in. Wait! Better take a recorder. 
Good idea. I'll play a jaunty tune that he won't be able to resist dancing to, and then Garibaldi, you shoot him. Ah, the old number four, Commander, gets him every time. Their efforts are off to a bad start as Garibaldi gets shot. He's got body armor, so he'll live. But the moment Sinclair has turned the corner, he gets nabbed and dragged into the alien section without a mask. So Sinclair naturally has to go in there and rescue him. But then, his mask is stolen too. That's when Delenn shows up to save the day, bodily carrying Garibaldi out like a pack mule. But this is significant because she had been strictly ordered to observe Sinclair and not to interfere in any way. So this shows that she is now willing to do more than quietly nudge, but to openly take action in support of him. This leaves him free for the final mano a mano fight with the bad guy, who after showing off the morph ability gets chucked into an electrified grate. I mean, that's a safety violation right there. We're going to have to ding you for that one. Although, you know, it'd be wonderfully ironic if the maintenance worker that the bad guy killed and replaced was actually heading down here to fix that and also remove the bear trap that he's going to step in next and the hive of bees that will fall on his head. Why did you do it? There is a hole in your mind. Then he activates his Minbari self-destruct device. Compressor doors! Seal up the section! Not with you inside! Damn it, do it! Hey, you know, you can move while you're talking. It's not against the rules. Dialogue is considered a free action. He escapes, but the bomb is so powerful it makes the spinning station unstable, nearly smashing it into the Vorlons, who have been patiently waiting for their turn to start shooting at somebody. Luckily, they managed to sort this mess out without hitting someone's warship or falling out of the sky, and having seen what they did, the Vorlons seem to reconsider their plans and let Sinclair go about his business. Kosh is out of critical now, so we can wrap things up. Delenn gives Sinclair what info she can about the Mimbari bad guy, and Sinclair gets a special meeting with Jakar. Seems that checkered coat guy often did work for the Narn and was bringing the changeling net for a rendezvous in the Tigris system with somebody, a system that was passed through by the Narn ship that Jakar refused to allow to be scanned for a while. The plan was no doubt to use it to allow the assassin to come on board posing as a member of the crew. The sneaking on board in that ship was the only option they had left. Jakar denies this, of course, so Sinclair reveals he has a plan of his own. The drink Jakar just finished had a wee bit of nanotechnology in it, a way of keeping track of him. And if anything happens to B5, Sinclair's got some friends that will hunt Jakar down and ruin his day. But it turns out, this was all just to mind-screw Jakar. Sinclair figured that any real transmitter would eventually be found, gotten rid of, and Jakar would do what he pleases. Now, though, they will never be able to find it. So he's always going to wonder if this was a bluff or if that it's still in there and he just couldn't find it. Of course, they'll put Jakar through a ridiculously thorough and likely unpleasant series of tests trying to get something that doesn't exist. It's like cryptozoology of anal probes. So Kosh recovers and gets a proper non-toxic welcome to the station, but Sinclair's bothered by what the assassin said. You wouldn't be holding anything out on me, would you, old friend? Commander, I would never tell you anything. That was not in your best interest. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Jeez. I need this station like I need a hole in the mind. Again, the special edition proved a tremendous improvement over the original, not the least of which feeling like it was part of the series as opposed to being separated from it, with the obvious exception of a few different characters as well as different makeup for two of our three main aliens. It still got a few problems with too much information being dumped on the audience, but that doesn't mean I think that every instance of exposition in this episode was bad. Lando's speech about the fallen Centauri and Sinclair's about the Battle of the Line, they're powerful and effective. I just think they would have stood out all the more if some of the others that hadn't been needed could have been left behind. One of the other main strengths on display is showcasing how this long game approach to the storytelling could work. A lot of pieces have been put into position that will see resolution. As I said, next month we'll be getting to Babylon Squared, which will show more about the fate of Babylon 4. But perhaps the greatest was a story that would need to be abandoned. As I hinted at, there were unanswered questions about the assassination attempt and cover-up. The stalled elevator and no record of it happening, for example. The intention was that Takashima was an unwitting supporter in all of that, thanks to Psycor manipulation that made her an agent who didn't even know she was an agent. 
There were numerous clues dropped, including the use of her identification for the assassin to visit with Checkered Coat Guy, which would have culminated in, spoilers if you haven't seen the Chrysalis review yet, would have culminated in her being the one to shoot Garibaldi at the end of Season 1. Because she chose not to come back, that stuff was jettisoned for the most part. The agent thing would be used elsewhere, sure, but otherwise... Well, probably the best answer is that when the mission failed, she was recalled to ensure her loyalty to Sinclair was not interfering with her programming. Next week, we continue with our Babylon 5 run with the sort of prequel-sequel movie in the beginning, where you can see much of what is alluded to about the earth Mimbari conflict firsthand. See you next time! Beep.